All rise, 75th District Court is now in session. The Honorable Michael D. Carpenter presiding. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. I know we're behind a little bit on our 2.30. Um, I do have one motion for, to set aside that I don't think is contested. I think it's scheduled for three. I think I'll call that real quick. Take care of that. If it's contested, then we'll put it behind yours and come back. So, Mr. Schwinski, are you ready to proceed on the Jose Guerrero files? Yes, I am, Your Honor. Calling case of People's State of Michigan versus Jose Angel Guerrero, file 07 2630SM and 14-2076SM. Also identify yourselves for the record. Thank you, Patrick Swinsky for the people. Mr. Guerra, please identify yourself for the record. Jose Guerra, representing myself. All right, today's time and date set for a motion to set aside convictions. Uh, Mr. Swinsky, have the people had an opportunity to look at the documentation and reach out to any victims and uh, have do you have an objection to either of these? Um, it was multiple questions, so I'll answer each one. Yes, I did review the documentation. We did reach out and sent a notice to the victim pursuant to the statute. Um, as far as any input from the victim, there is none. You know, I do have some concerns just given the his overall history. However, given the change in the statute, I, I do acknowledge that he is eligible for expungement of of the two charges that you requested expungement today. My understanding is there's another hearing on, I believe on Friday, where he's requesting an expungement of the other two convictions that he has. Um, with that said, I'll leave it to the court's discretion, Your Honor. All right. Mr. Guerra, uh, the law did change recently. Up until now, you could not get a, a domestic violence conviction overturned, uh, and you couldn't get multiples. Um, particularly if you had other charges, but it does appear that your request does follow um, that it has been seven years since the most recent conviction here in district court. I see that you're eligible for it. Um, what have you been doing recently in your life? So since those convictions, I've, I've done a, a multitude of things. I, I went back to school I uh, got my master's degree in business. Uh, I've stayed gainfully employed, um, you know, since then. And, um, you know, I haven't been in any trouble at all. I haven't even got as much as a speeding ticket since this incident. Um, so it was uh, uh, a couple of really bad days um, that I certainly am not um, trying to make light of. I mean, it was, it was a terrible time in my life, but it's since then I've had absolutely no issues and, and certainly grown from this experience. And, um, would love to, to get those behind me and, and continue on uh, the path of doing the right thing, right? And, and maintaining my status as a uh, successful part of society. All right. I uh, have looked and reviewed the files as well as the register of actions. I am going to grant the request on both files. I've signed the orders, they've been presented to me, will be adjourned on these cases. Thank you, Mr. Swinski. Thank you, Mr. Guerra. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you, Thank you Your Honor. Calling now the case of People's State of Michigan versus Shannon Maxwell, file 210576SD. Counsel, identify yourselves for the record, please. I tell you, on behalf of the people. Peter Durant, on behalf of Shannon Maxwell, who is seated to my left. Uh, Your Honor, no, the lights are appearing on any of the microphones. I just want to make sure that the means. Ah, uh, thank you. It's recording one way, but not both. There we go. Thank you for that. Uh, so we are on the record of people of the state of Michigan versus Shannon Maxwell. Ms. Dusso has placed her appearance for the people. Mr. Peter Durant for the defendant. This is the time and date set for an arraignment as well as a motion. Is your client familiar with the amended complaint and the charge in that complaint and the maximum penalty, sir? Yes, Your Honor. If you want to, if we want to handle the arraignment first, would waive a reading of the information. I went over the amended charges with my client, she understands the possible penalties and everything involved. How would you plead your client then? She would plead not guilty at this time, Your Honor. Not guilty, plea will be under the records of the court. The arraignment has been completed. So we'll move on now to the motion. Let's do so, are the people ready to proceed? We are, Your Honor. Um, we've, Mr. Durance and I have discussed prior to coming into court that I think there will be stipulations to people's exhibits one and two, uh, exhibit one being a uh, CD recording of there were actually two 911 calls in this case that I, I believe are the subject of the 
question in Mr. Durant's motion, as well as the CAD notes from the stop. Um, so I, if I could ask that those be admitted by stipulation, I can present the court with the CAD notes and play the 911 calls. Mr. Drantz, any objection or void near necessary for exhibits one and two? No, Your Honor, no objection. We would stipulate. All right, one and two will be admitted. What do I need to do to connect this so that the sound will play? <laughs> I see this. Yep, you can try, try that. Two is the CAD notes you said? Yes. I think Katrina will take care of the remainder. Okay.
two. There's a second. There's a second. Your Honor, when you're ready, I would call Officer Hager. Go ahead. Will I be sworn up? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Help you guys. I do. Do you state and spell your first and last name for the record, please? Robert Hager, R-O-B-E-R-T-H-A-G-E-R. -E -E Thank you. And what do you do for a living? I'm a police officer for the city of Midland. How long have you been a police officer? I've been a police officer 21 years. And how long have you worked for the city of Midland? Uh, just over six years. Now, were you working in that capacity on April 24th of 2021? Yes, I was. And uh, around about seven... 23 or so were you uh, dispatched to for basically be on the lookout uh, for a vehicle i was do you recall what type of vehicle that was uh it was a white suv and uh, even if even if you don't remember the license plate off hand right now were you aware of what the license plate number of that vehicle was i was i believe it was david tom david 1818 uh, were you able to locate that vehicle i was where did you initially find the vehicle? Uh, uh, North Saginaw Road near Wheeler, between Wheeler and Tucker Street. And um, were you directly behind the vehicle at that point? I was. Anything obscuring your view of the vehicle? No. Um, what did you know at that point about why you were dispatched to find this vehicle? I was advised uh, 911 had received a uh, 911 call. Uh, about a female leaving the post office who possibly could be intoxicated and driving. As you followed uh, the vehicle, which, as you indicated, uh, did did that vehicle match the description you were given of the vehicle from 911? It did. And as you were following that vehicle, um, did, did it do anything to sort of catch your attention or cause you concern? Yes. And what was that? Um, as it approached the intersection of Saginaw and Eastman Road, it made a right hand, it stopped for the red light and then made a right hand turn northbound onto Eastman. As it made the right turn, um, instead of staying as close to the curb, um, to stay in the right lane as it made a right turn, it went directly into the left lane, um, made an improper turn. All right, so based on your training and experience, what is somebody supposed to do when they are making a right hand turn? They're supposed, as they make the right-hand turn, they're supposed to keep their vehicle as close to the curb as possible and stay in the right lane as it makes the turn. So when there are two, when you're turning onto a street uh, where there are two lanes going the same direction, uh, you're expected to stay in the lane closest to the curb? Correct. 
Um, did the vehicle in this case do that? No. Uh, was there even an attempt to go into the most right-hand lane? There was not. Uh, what did you do at that point? At that point, I activated my lights to initiate a stop on the vehicle. And uh, did that vehicle come to a stop? It did. Did you make contact with the driver? I did. Was there anyone else in the vehicle? There was not. Um, who was the driver of that vehicle? Uh, Miss Maxwell. And do you see the driver here in court today? I do. Could you identify her by what she's wearing? Uh, she's seated next to the defense counsel with a black mask on, glasses on top of her head. Uh, may the record reflect the identification of the defendant? Um, any void year or objection? No objection, Your Honor. The record reflect that the officer identified the defendant. So at the, <clears throat> at the point where you stopped, Ms. Maxwell, um, in, in your mind, what was your reason or reasons for the stop? An improper turn. Um, but as you had indicated, you did also have the knowledge from Central Dispatch about the concerns of the 911 caller. Yes. Um, and, and again, in your training and experience, um, is it more common for people under the influence to commit traffic violations? It is. The patrol car that you were driving at the time of the stop, did that have a um, video camera in it? Yes, it did. And you also wear body cameras when you're performing your duties? I do. Were both of those cameras working to the best of your knowledge during the stop? Yes, they were. Have we reviewed the, um, the video from your dash cam, let's call it? I have. And uh, if I could approach you. You may. So this is People's Proposal Exhibit 3. Does that look like the CD that we reviewed prior to coming to court today? It does. And on that CD, is that a fair and accurate depiction of uh, the following of Ms. Maxwell's vehicle and the stop that you performed on her? Yes, it is. I would ask for admission of People's Exhibit 3, Your Honor. Would your objection? No objection, Your Honor. All right, it's submitted. And Your Honor, I, I would ask to play this dash cam video as well. All right.
Yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> so, uh, Officer Hager, 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 Hager. Okay, I want to make sure I'm saying right. I, I wrote Hagen in my notes. I want to make sure I'm saying your name right. Uh, so, Officer Hager, uh, you you stated that you pulled her over, her being Miss Maxwell, for improper lane use by turning to the second lane and not turning into the right hand lane. Correct. Correct. How many of those stops have you performed in the past month? A couple. A couple. How many have you ticketed for? None. None. Uh, why is that? I, I chose not to make a citation or issue a citation on those stops. Is that because you believe it's a minor offense not needing a citation? It's still a traffic offense. Uh, that doesn't answer my question, officer. You, is, you didn't give those citations those past couple times because you believe it's a minor offense and a warning was sufficient. I, Correct. I believe the warning was sufficient on those stops. Yeah. Okay, so you you don't think it's a very serious traffic code violation, but it, as you stated, you believe it is a traffic code violation. Correct. Well, it could be a serious traffic violation, if I mean those types of um, traffic violations lead to crashes at times. So it could be a serious traffic violation. But did it in this case? It did not. And did it in any other other cases where you did not ticket that it those did. drivers? No, there was no crashes. Okay. You also stated that you observed another traffic code violation where she stopped her vehicle ahead of the white line indicating where she's stopping the intersection, correct? Correct. But you didn't pull her over for that? That wasn't a reason, no. That wasn't the reason? Why would you wait for an additional reason versus pulling her over for the first offense? I, I have no reason why. Okay. Um, you also submitted a report w with this whole incident. Is that report true and honest to the best of your recollection? I believe so, yes. And as we observed in the dash cam footage as well, did you observe Miss Maxwell swerving or doing anything else prior to the turn into the second lane? After reviewing my video, I did see two different swerves that she made. But you didn't put that in your report? That is correct. Okay, so would you believe that if it was relevant, you would have put it in the report. Yes. Okay. But you didn't notice it at first. You didn't specifically, you didn't notice it at the time you were following her, correct? Correct. Um, so you were following her. So you were following her based on that tip of the 911 call, correct? Yes. There was no other reason for you to be following her, let alone in that area at the time, correct? Other, yeah. Uh, no, there was not. I mean, I was looking for her vehicle. Okay. And then you stated when you pulled her over, you could smell the odor of intoxicants, correct? Yep, alcoholic beverages, intoxicants. Okay. Yeah. And obviously you were the only officer reporting at the time when you pulled her over. There was no partner or anyone with you as we- That is correct. Just okay. Me. No further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Redirect? No, Your Honor. Any witness uh, be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Any objection? No objection. Thank you, officer. Thank you. Any other witnesses or exhibits or proofs? No, Your Honor. Mr. Trance, any exhibits or proofs? Yes, Your Honor. I would like to, uh, my client would like to testify, Your Honor. Okay. Let's come on up, please, ma'am. We'll have you sworn in. Before you take a seat, if you would, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So, on the gap? Yep. There you go. Let's say it a little I'm sorry, louder. Your Honor. Let's go this way. And you do, you do swear? Yes. Thank you. Your witness. Can you please state your full name for the record? Shannon Renee Maxwell. And then, Ms. Maxwell, if at any point anyone asks you to clarify, just know that because of the mask and because of that this needs to be recorded, someone may ask you to speak up, okay? Okay. <clears throat> So you were driving down the road on April 24th of 2021, correct? Yes. And at that day and time, you were leaving work, correct? Yes. And on the intersection on Saginaw and Eastman is on your way home from work, correct? Yes, can be. Can be. So you were running errands at the time, correct? Yes. Specifically, where were you going at the, at the day and time? I just planned to stop at the dollar store on my way home. The dollar store, where's the dollar store at? Like behind McDonald's and the Secretary of State's office. Okay, and, and so which road is that on? It's in the parking lot between, well, behind Family Fair. 
Okay, and where's the entry to that parking lot? Uh, usually you take the road right next to McDonald's. Okay, is that is the road that's next to McDonald's, is that pretty close to the intersection? Yes. And which side of the road is that road next to McDonald's on? On the left. So would you say that it's pretty close? How, how close would you say that driveway is to the intersection? It's just past the car dealership, so it's, I don't know, maybe an eighth of a mile or less. Okay. So you were turning right onto, sat onto Eastman because you were going to run to the dollar store. Yes. And did the car in front of you also turn into the second hand lane? I thought so. Did you notice any other cars turning into the second lane or anything? No. Have you seen that before at that intersection? Yes. And have you seen any police officers pull anyone over at that intersection? No. Okay. So you believe, and you were following the car in front of you, correct? I thought so. I just wanted to be in the lane that I needed. Okay. And you believe that at that time you were following them and it was okay for you to turn in that lane, correct? Yes. You believed it was okay because you were making a left-hand turn, as you said, within an eighth of a mile on the left-hand side of that road, correct? Yes. Okay. No further questions, Your Honor. Cross-examination. Uh, Ms. Maxwell, so you admit obviously that you were driving this particular vehicle on this particular day. Yes. Um, and you, you are familiar, it sounds like, with the area. You know where the dollar store is? Yes. You know there is a dollar store right next to your work, correct? Yes. Right, you wanted to go to this particular dollar store, though. Um, have you gone this way to get there before? Yes. Um, is there anything anything in your way, anything to stop you from turning into that right-hand lane? You just wanted to be in the left-hand lane? The right. Left lane. Well, I didn't know there was anything wrong with it. I tend to choose the lane that I need, especially if it's coming up quickly. Okay. No further questions. Any redirect? No, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. May your client rejoin you? Yes, Your Honor. All right, please rejoin your attorney. Any rebuttal? I, I would recall Officer Hager, and if we could get the screen back up there so we can talk about it. Okay. Katrina, would you mind coming in and hitting whatever buttons are necessary? Deb, if you mind learning what those buttons are, that'd be great. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, sir. And I'll start to remind you, you're still under oath. Yes, sir.
obviously you you don't pull over everyone for turning into the second hand lane every time you see someone do it, correct? That's correct. identifying the make, model, and color of defendant's car is relevant and somehow pertinent to the anonymous 911 call. However, in People v. Horton 283 Mishap uh, 105 to 2009 case, it's stating that a tip must be reliable in its assertion of illegality, not just in its tendency to identify and determine a person. Further, the people have cited Wren v. United States as the primary authority for their argument. The court in Wren explicitly states that although a traffic offense may serve as a basis to stop selective enforcement of the law to suit that officer's subjective intent is unconstitutional. Based on the specific traffic offense used as the justification for the stop, a reasonable person would conclude that the officer selectively enforced this provision of the traffic code to achieve a specific goal, that goal acting on the anonymous 911 phone call. <clears throat> And then the people further cited a People v. Spence. It's a unpublished case with the holding being the totality of the circumstances should be considered when assessing a police officer's suspicion of criminal activity. And the totality of the circumstances is presently that the turn into the second lane on the right hand, the right hand turn into the second lane is exactly the type of offense cited in the case Navarrete v. California as cited in my motion as being a minor enough offense to be constitutionally suspect when used in corroborating anonymous tip of drunk driving. 
Specifically, the Navarrete case stated that offenses such as speeding or not wearing a seatbelt are, quote, so tenuously, tenuously connected to drunk driving that a stop on these grounds alone would be constitutionally suspect, reading that minor traffic offenses would be constitutionally suspect based on if they were coupled with corroborating an anonymous tip. Officers finding that the right-hand turn alone is justification to corroborate the anonymous tip of drunk driving is constitutionally suspect based on the testimony here in court, as well as the reasonable argument that he placed an undue reliance, almost an entire reliance, on the anonymous tip as it relates to the People v. Pagano's court's decision that, rely, that sole reliance on an anonymous tip does not overcome the Fourth Amendment protections. As such, the defense argues that the turn in the second lane served as a pretext for the officer to act upon the anonymous 911 call almost entirely, specifically as a, a, quote, violation of a minor traffic code as a, an offense that should have been highlighted in Navarrete v. California as a minor offense, supported by the officer's testimony here that it is, a, in his belief, a minor offense as long as no, tra as no accident is involved, holding that the underlying motive of the officer in this case, as, what, as a part of the totality of circumstances, he used any possible justification as a pretext to enforce his actions based on the anonymous 911 tip and Sole reliance on a non an anonymous 911 tip under People v. Pagano is unconstitutional. Reading People v. Pagano along with the language of Navarrete v. California, reliance on corroborating minor offenses with an anonymous 911 call, as the officer stated, he was only following the car because of the 911 call, which was anonymous. Reading those two cases together would support a finding that this stop was unconstitutional based on the reliance on the anonymous 911 phone call entirely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Do so. Your Honor, what we saw in the video today is that there was a, a clear traffic violation here. And while the defense, the defense's argument basically is that everybody makes traffic violations and the police somehow shouldn't be allowed to stop somebody if they don't stop everybody, um, as logic would dictate and as the, the officer indicated, that's just not possible. Um, in some cases, they may have you know, other reasons or um, information that may lead them to want to stop somebody. But um, quite frankly, the, the case law is very clear in that when there is a traffic violation, it is sufficient to justify the stop of the vehicle if the circumstances create a reasonable suspicion that a traffic offense has been committed. Um, that is exactly what happened here. There was a, a traffic violation. It was very clear simply because every single time that violation is committed, somebody doesn't get stopped, doesn't negate the fact that in this case, it gave the officer the right to stop somebody. Sure, he had other information um, from that 911 tip that, that may have made him want to stop this vehicle more than he might have wanted to stop a different vehicle, but that doesn't negate his ability to stop this vehicle or any other vehicle when they commit a traffic violation, no matter how minor it is. Um, the, as the officer testified, sometimes minor violations can become major violations. It's within the officer's discretion to decide whether they're going to stop somebody or whether they're going to ticket somebody. Um, and, it, you know, again, in looking at, at the case slide, I attached um, people the Spence uh, to the, the brief that I submitted in response. And, and I think that case does a, a good job of kind of going through this idea of, of pretext, pretext stops um, and what that case says in, in multiple places is that a traffic violation is sufficient to justify the stop of the vehicle if the circumstances create a reasonable suspicion that a traffic offense has been committed. Uh, it goes through and, and talks about sort of the facts of uh, other cases here in, in where officers had no, you know, no other reason to stop a vehicle, where they just had that anonymous tip and no other information, no other uh, traffic violations. And yes, in those cases, those stops were invalidated because they had nothing besides that, that 911 call. In this case, Officer Hager, one of the first things he said was that he stopped the vehicle because of the improper turn. Um, again, yes, he had other information that, that would have uh, led him, you know, perhaps to want to stop this vehicle more than he stopped, than he would want to stop another vehicle, but that doesn't somehow change the fact that this violation was committed and that when the violation was committed, at that point, he had the chance, he, he had the right to stop her. Um, you know, again, I, I think we saw in the video that I, I don't know, you know, I, I, I don't want to think that Ms. Maxwell was lying, but it seemed that she drove past the place that she intended to go. Now, we know that the officer's lights were on prior to where she may have needed to turn, but um, 
it didn't look like she was making that turn. And as far as her, you know, her rationale, well, I turned into the left lane because I wanted to be in the left lane, you know, that may be true, but there was uh, ample opportunity for her to turn into the right lane, signal to the left lane, and then signal that she was going to make a left turn and, and then enter that left turn lane. Um, there was no traffic preventing her from doing that. She, she could have made the turn just as the officer did in that right lane and then moved into the left lane, nothing was stopping her. So uh, unfortunately not knowing that that was wrong is not a defense. It, it's still violation of the traffic code. It's still something that the officer can choose to stop her for. Um, you know, or in another case, if he's got a more pressing matter to attend to, he could choose not to stop somebody for that. That's within his decision making and within his, his prerogative to make that choice. In this case, he did make that choice to stop her based on that violation. Uh, and in pursuant to the case law and, and what you know, is, is clearly outlined in many of these cases is that once there is a, a traffic violation uh, that has been committed, that can be used as a basis of stop. So I, I ask that this court deny the defense's motion. Mr. Jones. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Pursuant to the officer's own testimony, when asked the question between turning between two cars turning into the second lane, he responded that he would pick Ms. Maxwell's car 100% of the time, or he would pick it solely because of the information on the 911 call. Basing his decision to pull her over entirely on that anonymous 911 call is the exact type of abuse that People Be Pagano was intended to protect persons against. By basing his decision on that 911 call, not just knowing that information and not just utilizing that information, but basing his decision on that 911 call under People v. Pagano is constitutionally suspect. Again, reading the case together, Navarrete v. California with the, sus the constitutional suspect corroborating minor offenses to a non-anonymous phone call, as well as People v. Pagano, it's, pretty, it's clear that the officer was following Ms. Maxwell and he was going to pull her over for anything he could think of based solely on that 911 call information and that he was going to try and corroborate that information the best he could. The argument that she could have or may not have turned left into the driveway at the time while an officer is behind her flashing his lights for her to pull over would not should not be considered as part of the factual basis here because she was now no longer going to she her. testified to that. Why shouldn't I consider anything she testified to as part of this decision? But you the, put her on the you put her on the witness stand. You're, of course, Your you're Honor. So you're asking me to look past some some testimony and information just because it's not favorable to your client. Let me. You, let me. You can say she'd have less weight, but saying I shouldn't consider it at all is a bit of a stretch, don't you believe? Let me rephrase, Your Honor. Okay. The hypothetical argument that it didn't look like she was turning into that driveway. She did. You, you may consider it that she was turning going to be turning left, but once the officer activated his lights, her goal was no longer to turn into that driveway and get to the dollar store. It was now to get to a safe place for her and the officer, for the officer to conduct his traffic stop. So the fact she no longer was turning left into the driveway when there's oncoming traffic and she simply pulled off into a further parking lot after that oncoming traffic abated, that's the factual basis here is that she no longer was going to the drive dollar store. She was obeying the law, signaling that she was going to turn into this new further parking lot to allow the officer to conduct a traffic stop safely so they're no longer in the road. Eastman is a busy lane, and I believe she was doing the right thing, trying to protect both herself and her, the officer. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the testimony you heard today was um, audio calls from 911, like People's Exhibit Number 1, People's Exhibit Number 2, which is the CAD um, call, and People's Exhibit Number 3, which is the dash cam footage. Testimony of Officer Hager and testimony of Shannon Maxwell. The 911 calls, I, I, I don't know, I guess, the full 911 call, the anonymous tip. In this case, it was somebody who knew the defendant, worked with the defendant, and the details were significant. She knew the type of alcohol that she drank. She stated that Postmaster had made a, made a call because three people during her route had to assist her. And that she was concerned about it before she even got in a car that she would cause damage to somebody. This is not somebody just in one car thinking they saw a drunk driver. This is somebody who was concerned that she was intoxicated and wanted to try to protect. She didn't want her name, but she had significantly more details than some driver by or passerby. Factually, she knew her name. She knew about where she lived. She knew what she did for a job. She knew her license plate. 
she said her postmaster said that there were, that she was intoxicated. She knew that she drank fireballs and that she drank on the job and this was a regular part. She knew where she was parked. She knew, uh, and then she was asked to call back and she did. She called back and said that she was leaving. This, this is significant as far as facts go of someone who's calling in. They don't want to be known, but they knew a lot of details. They knew a lot of details about her level of intoxication. Officer Hager, armed with that information, it would have been a, a little bit different analysis, I suspect, had he pulled over at Fast Eddie's parking lot or Pizza Hut parking lot, which are both on North Saginaw Road. North Saginaw Road and East Bend are the two busiest intersections. That's the busiest intersection that we have in our community. He testified that she pulled too far into uh, for the stop. The video shows that she did, that she pulled right over to the left-hand lane and that he stopped her, made a decision to stop her after that. He did acknowledge that it had to have been two people that did it and that he was armed with information that someone was intoxicated and the other person wasn't or he didn't have information and he would pull that person over. I'm glad he did. You can't ignore the fact that he knows some information. Had he pulled her over into the Fast Eddie's parking lot, I think that maybe is the type of case that the Court of Appeals has decided uh, in, in April of this year to make a determination that just pulling somebody over because someone thinks that someone's drunk, even though the officer witnesses no violations, that's the type of case. This one's factually distinct, distinctives. She did violate not just one, but two different violations. And having someone intoxicated driving in the two busiest, the busiest intersection in our community and have a police officer ignore it because he's afraid that it would be a, a wrongful uh stop is a ludicrous uh, uh, ex expanse of the law. Yes, had he stopped her without seeing anything, Mr. Durant is absolutely right. Had he stopped her at Fast Eddie's parking lot, I would have I would have listened and followed exactly what he said. He's right. You can't just take the information with nothing more. Good driving, non-speeding, no violations whatsoever. That case says that. That does. But once you see the violation, he's not to turn a blind eye to the fact that there is, armed with the knowledge that she might be intoxicated just because the caller wished to be anonymous. I don't find that the case in Pagano goes so far as to say that police officers now must not look to any violations to be able to pull over. That must be a major one. That's dangerous. That's reckless. That can cause crashes. That can cause death. That can cause significant injury, not only to the person intoxicated, but someone who just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. This officer testified and the court observed there were two violations of the law. She stopped too far at the busiest intersection in our community. And then she turned and she made her own self-serving statement. She was going to turn left. That's why she pulled into the left-hand lane. But even if she was, it's still a violation. The officer armed with the information that she might be intoxicated had a reasonable suspicion that there was something going wrong. He pulled her over. And the facts were she didn't have her turn signal on. She went and drove past this, that section. I think it was a self-serving statement. Maybe she could have pulled over, but she even if she missed the first driveway, there was still McDonald's, which has a parking lot, which is safe. And then the next driveway after that, which she pulled over. Yes, he did use that information, but there was a violation, and I think factually it's distinguished between the two, and there are significant details given by the caller, though wanting to remain anonymous, um, that knew very much that this person was likely intoxicated. I'm denying the motion. I may would have, again, had uh, Officer Hager pulled her over in the Fast Eddie's parking lot or a pizza parking lot or Papa John's parking lot, or maybe even Comerica parking lot on the corner, this motion would have had much more traction. But factually, there was enough for him to make the stop. There was a violation, though minor it was. I do not think that the case of Gano meant to go that far. Anything else you'd like to place on the record before we conclude in this case, Mr. Durant? Not at this time, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, and, and Ms. Duso? No, Your Honor. Thank okay. you. Okay, we'll be adjourned. Returning to exhibit number two. Those are other cases. So that was the, the round. 
Is your client going to be by Zoom? I mean, this next one.